Good afternoon. So this is the, the uh, panel on the future of wearable apps. Make sure you're in the right room. Uh, my name is Sean Harden. I'll be moderating the panel today. And we have a really awesome group of experts in this space. So I encourage you to pull up the uh, bios on the uh, GlazeCon mobile app and take a peek as we're, as we're jumping in. But we have a ton to cover. We only have 30 minutes to do it. And so we're going to jump right in to this discussion. So wearable devices are different from all prior computing applications and platforms in that they are so much more personal and immediate. Glasses are literally in our face and become a part of our field of view. Watches, bands, jewelry uh, are touching and sensing our bodies. So what are the implications of this? And how will apps on wearables be similar to or different from the apps that we've come to know and love on tablets and phones? Uh, it's challenging. Uh, I think when you looked at what happened with mobile application development, people could take a lot of the metaphors that existed on the web and apply them to that smartphone, apply them to that tablet. So the experience wasn't dramatically different. With wearables, you have a few constraints. You have the constraints of your input devices. You have the constraint of that tiny little screen here or here or elsewhere in your body. So it's really how do you maximize that experience and how do you make it meaningful? I mean, when you develop something that's running on a wearable device, it's not just a matter of a quality user experience, but a bad user experience can be distracting. Or if you're working with an Epson Mavario, as many folks in the room has, I say not nodding heads here, you can code yourself a headache. You can code yourself a migraine. So that's particularly challenging, and we try to embrace these devices and the kinds of applications for them. It requires a lot of creativity to overcome those challenges. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that um, one of the things that, that we always have to keep in mind, too, is that the interactions tend to be so much more passive with wearable devices. It's, it's a situation where with a traditional mobile device, you're going to be pulling it out of your pocket, you're actively using it for some type of purpose, and then you're putting it away. Uh, same with a tablet, but with a device like Glass or the Epsons or any of the other slew of, of glasses that are coming out, as well as watches, it's a much more passive type of interaction. So as you're going about the tasks that you're, that you're doing, we see a lot of this in the enterprise, as you're going about your work, as you're going about your tasks, you're getting access to information, uh, but it's not necessarily you seeking it out. It's being provided to you. So we have to be careful about doing that in an intelligent way, um, not overloading the user with information. Um, and just doing it in a graceful and non-distracting way, because I think you're right, you can definitely code yourself into a headache. Um, I, I don't know if it's always passive, you know, uh, Pebble, we're, we're trying, we're actually finding that people are actively using their Pebble for stuff. Playing games, that's an active thing. Uh, they are, you know, like checking in on Foursquare and uh, looking for Yelp nearby because it's more convenient. So I'm, I agree with you in general, it's passive. Notifications is a huge part of the Pebble experience. That's what people mostly do with it. But I think that what we're finding is more and more feedback about, you know, getting those microtransactions, those what we call tiny moments of awesome on your wrist going. And, and you know, glass, which I'm wearing is buggy as hell right now. Uh, it's still pretty awesome as an active device in terms of taking photos and video and sharing. I mean, to me, that's one of the primary uses that I have it for. I took a picture of the audience just now. It's because I can, you know, hands-free capture something real quick. Yeah, I, I, I think you're I actually think you're right. There's also a contextual relevance, too, yeah. to, to wearables, so that even when it is an active interaction, it's Absolutely. contextually relevant to whatever's going on around you. Well, it's, it's finding the, I guess, the balance between a platform that has to be passive part of the time, but then can be active at the same time. So how do you balance those two together so that you're not bothering someone nonstop with information they don't care about, but also, when it needs to be active, the screen's big enough or the interface is solid enough that you can actually be able to have a legible platform in the first place. We, you know, build, building on that point, Q, um, <clears throat> one of the things we talked about in our prep call was this idea that, you know, we look today at a, pretty much 100% of today's wearables are basically tethered to some kind of a device, usually the user's smartphone. And there are some that advance the point that that's not only a byproduct of uh, today's limitations with battery power and such, but actually that it may be a natural and long-term model for applications where we kind of end up with this kind of personal network of sensors around our body and a sort of natural home for the actual application engagement piece on the smartphone and the high-quality display on, the, on, on that device. 
What do you guys think of that? I mean, is that is that where we're going long term? Is that just a, a byproduct of our current sort of battery power issues and other things like that? I think so. I mean, you know, you when we talked earlier, we kind of all assumed there was a display. I, I would like to think wearables don't necessarily have a display. Maybe you're wearing a band that has a microphone and no display and just a status LED that goes red, green, orange. And that's the level of status notification you want. Red means it's contextual. Red means something really needs your attention. And perhaps you now have a glass display or a phone you pull out to look at. Uh, the microphone lets you interact with that device in an active way, obviously. You're not just passive. It's, it's the other way around. So I, I'm not saying that you know this is just one use case and I think it's going to happen. But back to your networking idea on networking, I think this is one of the things we believe at Pebble a lot is that the future is not one device does all. You know, like uh, Galaxy Gear's example of a device that tries to do that, everything but the kitchen sink on a device, and I don't think it works. I mean, pe that's not what people want. What we think people want is, you know, say you have a device like Pebble, you wear it all the time, you know, the alarm, the vibration alarm wakes you up in the morning, et cetera, et cetera, the battery life is good enough, but you want to go running and you want to get some vitals while you run. Pebble can't do that. But that's okay, because now you have a band you wear on the other arm or on your chest that you only wear one hour a day, but it uses the same charger, right? And you only have to charge it once a month because it lasts forever because you're only using one hour a day. And you don't even have to have an internet connection for it to work because it's talking to your Pebble or to whatever other device you have and you know it's dumping its data into whatever device has the most storage. And then that device goes to the internet when it's got a connection again through your phone. I think we're gonna see a lot of that happening. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a fantastic point in terms of looking at wearables beyond, we, we so often focus on the input and output, um, but looking at them, input from the sense of, of user input, um, but we, we should start thinking them more as, as an ecosystem of devices that's existing on the body in some way. Um, I know this is something that you know we draw a lot of inspiration from. If you've ever read Rainbow's End, you know the idea that your entire clothing becomes a sort of one gigantic wearable device. Your clothing, your contact lenses, your watches—you know—all of that ties together and works together in concert. And yeah, maybe maybe in that example, the clothing is more of a sensor type of input, or than it is a, an active user type of input. But I think viewing them so that they all work together, building that ecosystem, and then viewing them as a single device, I think that's a, an excellent way to look at it. Right. I think that ultimately, what you're looking at is to achieve the ubiquity that we all want wearables to have. You can't focus on things like having screens all on, on everything. I mean, the goal should be cheap manufacturing, obviously, so that it can be disposable in some, in some essence. Because eventually, if you're wearing clothes that you can just throw away, if you have to spend $500 for a pair of shorts that are connected, that becomes an issue. Whereas if that's $15 because you don't have to worry about displays or LEDs and it just connects to the hub, whether that hub be an Android device or a wearable that you're wearing on your head or your iPhone, that works far better for the ultimate goal. And right now with technology in particular, because of battery life and cost, that's obviously a better direction to head in. But eventually, even when you're talking about form factor, that's probably a better direction to go into as far as us all using it every single day. So like, through, through uh, the lens of this panel, in terms of really the future of wearable apps, what, is, what are the implications of that? I mean, where, where and, and looking, you know, in the context of what we all know well with, you know, kind of apps and, and on smartphones and tablets, I mean, where's the app live? How do you write the app? Is it... Does it live on the phone? Does it live in the cloud? Does it live on the wearables? I mean, what, what's the model that you guys I, see emerging here? I think, Sean, part of what you have there is that when we talk about tethering, it's really a simplistic way to look at it. It is this personal network where all these devices fit in, where it's a matter that some of those devices will have screens, some won't. We, you know, we're familiar with the Pebble, for example, does a little vibration, but there's also wearables now that'll do constriction. They'll do other non-audible kinds of cues to you so that you understand where it becomes that kind of uh, sensory expansion. And then we're approaching in the whole glorious nerd sci-fi stuff of augmentation where you really have the sense that you not just your dog or your cat will know a storm is coming, you'll know a storm is coming because your left ear tickles. But that can be something that can be generated and supplied by the technology. And that's part of the creative challenge that exists because looking at it and thinking about it as just another screen or just another glass rectangle kind of restricts how you think about the technology. And I know, Miriam, when you live, when you live with glass, it's enchanting and so frustrating because you really can see all this opportunity 
and then be able to not fulfill all that dream yet. And that's the excitement of being on the early side. We're getting these little peaks, these little glimpses of the promise of this integrated personal network and then the issues of, of a body part overheating and rebooting and rebooting and rebooting. Yeah, I, I think, you know, and this is another thing that we think about a lot at Pebble is that we need to go beyond the thinking of what an app is traditionally and beyond the thinking of even what an OS is traditionally. Um, and that's kind of what we're, we're kind of trying to create an integrated platform. Uh, and we're looking at things like, like you look at Pandora, or one of our partners, there, you know, there's an app for your smartphone, most people use it and download it. And now there's an app for Pebble, and really all it is, it's, it's a companion app. It doesn't do anything other than remote control the app on your phone, but it's a binary, a piece of code that gets downloaded from our app store to your watch. Uh, in addition, there's Pandora on the web which might sometimes maybe be better for you to use because you can configure, create playlists, etc. So really, what is the app? To me, the app is all three parts, right? They kind of have synergy. You have the web component, you need the cloud to get all this music to come to you. You have to have the app on your phone because a binary on your phone right now is a better proposition than the web on your phone. And then you have the app, the binary on your watch. And to me, all three of them are, are the app. So imagine a, a bunch of network devices. They need a real-time OS that's really efficient and fast and can deal with a device that doesn't have a display and only a mic. Um, you, know, you, need, you need them to be able to mesh and connect in an intelligent way without feeling like you have some prosthesis that doesn't work half yes. the time, right? And so at the same time, when you put an app on this mesh, you're not putting an app on one device. You're putting an app on multiple devices. So I think the challenge will be for app developers is not only kind of the same challenge going from the web to the app ecosystem on the smartphone world, but to go from the app ecosystem on the smartphone world to a multiple app on multiple device ecosystem on a meshed network of basically body part extensions. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on, and, and we see we see the same type of the same type of thing in the enterprise. And here, the the challenge is that you have. Um, a, multiple types of, of glasses or multiple types of watches, and you have to centralize functionality so that you're developing one app that can be consumed on multiple types of devices. But at the same time, there has to be code that's actually running on the metal, right? There has to be a client somewhere that's providing that user experience. Um, and that's exactly one of the reasons that uh, when we refer to our platform, we're referring to it as a single thing, but really it is a, it's a number of different clients for different devices and then a central, centrally managed server infrastructure that allows you to connect to whatever you know, back-end systems you're trying to connect to. And one of the things that's interesting there is when you look at that model, you're really looking at a uh, something very similar to a service model. And one of the advantages there is we talked earlier about how you can, you can do real distracting types of, of things with these devices, especially in the realm of glasses. May, maybe not as much on some of the other wearables, but it, it's beneficial to have a relatively controlled or a relatively small population of client devices that have all of the research done to make sure that the user experience is, is slick and is, is useful and not distracting. Because user experience, if you look at a, an app store right now, and you have tons and tons of apps being de you know, developed on the device by millions and millions and millions and millions of developers. Um, if the user experience on one is suboptimal, it's probably not the end of the world. If the functionality works, it's still going to get used. On glasses, it can be a death knell because of all of the things that we talked about before. So I think looking at it as, as both client and server and with a service center, a service right. focus, I think but it's, it's key. I think that ultimately what we're looking to get towards is beyond using an app at all, honestly. It's, it's a matter of sure. augmenting the human reality situation to where it becomes a second sense. So as you mentioned, it's going to rain outside, so my ear starts to tingle. But there's a million other things that we can start to track in our day-to-day -day lives that we don't need an app that tells us what's going on. We know because that's just the new human condition that we've now realized. So and maybe an application <clears throat> collects that data and says, as a holistic view, as everything connected to you, this is what's going on with you, especially for medical situations, going to a doctor, whatever it may be. But in general, I'm living in my day-to-day -day life with beyond wearables, but actually implantable situations in which that's what's happening with me. And that's 
an ultimate end game that we're heading towards with this technology. Yeah, let me jump yeah, in for one second because <clears throat> so it sounds like we have a consensus that there's a different architecture for what may we may call today apps and maybe more experiences that are networked, that are mesh. In, in the, I want to talk about the business model and the business implications of this for a minute because I think it's pretty important. So in your case, Jeff, at Apex, obviously you guys are in more of an enterprise, you have more of a licensing model, I assume. Uh, what are the implications for this on the consumer side? Because today, obviously, we've got a whole ecosystem that's built around the app store on the device. I buy the app on my smartphone and I pay Apple, I pay Google Play. Well, what, 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 what do you guys see as the implications of this as we have more of a distributed model like you've all talked to here for wearables? And, and especially because I think we're all acutely interested in seeing the kind of innovation and the kind of rich product offerings that we'd like to see at the top of the stack on these devices, but we know that developers are going to need to find an ROI to be able to put the time into developing this. So how does that happen? How do we get there? I think... Um you know, in the Bay Area, we're very familiar with, oh, it's going to be ad supported. It'll be funded with ads. As always, I don't have a business plan, but ads are going to support it. And that doesn't work when it's something that's on your wrist or something that's in your eye. And those types of monetization models in consumer space can be much trickier. It's not going to be a matter of placing ads there. People are going to be resistant to having ads shoved into the retinas. There, there's a, a real barrier there. And Google was wise to. Uh, deny developers from putting in advertising mechanisms. So I think you have to look at other opportunities for monetization in the consumer space. We also do enterprise work at Brick Simple. That falls in traditional enterprise procurement licensing model, a very clear path to monetization. For a consumer, those opportunities may be, you know what, I'm not going to sell you my eyeball, but you're going to know my sensor data. You're going to know my location data, my shopping habits, how I'm traveling that that becomes the data that gets monetized. That's going to be a lot more uh, impressive or useful than having an impression, and it is going to require a marketing and advertising pivot, but maybe it's, in, at the end of the day, deeper data that gets offered up in exchange for using some of these applications and services for free. Right. I mean, imagine if you are The Gap, right, or you're any, I guess, any retail store, and you're pushing ads or information to various different people um, through their different body sensors or what they may be wearing. And you can detect, okay, when did the message get to them? What was their geolocation? They were near a Gap store, so we sent them this ad. How long did they stop at that place? Did they engage with the information? Did they go into the store through their geolocation? Did their heart rate increase? Did their heart rate decrease? What happened? And that data becomes far more important than did they just click? Now you actually know, do you care about The Gap or Banana Republic or whatever it may be? When I watch this movie trailer, what actually happened to you? That sort of thing. Yeah, I think uh, basically to me, the, the way I see the, the monetization is, is, you know, we're going to be collecting data. We're going to have to give up some of our, well, privacy. I mean, I personally don't think it's an issue, but I think that there, I think it's not an issue for those of us who are here in this room, but I think it's an issue for a lot of the people out there. I know people out there that still have issues uh, with around basic privacy on just the web. And so how do we convince them? Um, maybe they won't even know that we're collecting their heart rate or whatever, right. but, but I'd, I'd like to think that they will know and that they will give us permission. And so uh, to me, that's actually a bigger challenge with this ecosystem and, and monetizing it is, um, I think you're right, the, the model works of getting that data from them, but how do you get them to agree to it? Well, I think you have to, I guess, defeat the FUD, right? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And right now, there's an awareness issue amongst the general public. I mean, you know, that's why fitness is probably the number one application for wearables is just because everybody, especially in America, is very fitness crazy. Everybody's worried about calories and whatever. So that ties into a consumer model. But eventually, that's going to be a Trojan horse into wearables in a general consensus way. And then that will break down that fear and uncertainty about that so that people are more willing to, you're always going to have those who don't want any other information shared with anyone, but there are still people who won't even sign up to Twitter for that very reason right now. They refuse to have any of their information out there, and I'm more like you, I don't really care. You know, it's, yeah, that's I'm, me. I'm, I'm, I'm ready there. for the implants, bring it on. But, exactly, uh, yes. You know, I think, I, I, you know, one of the things I'm very aware of is because a lot of my community uh, outside of my work is not tech savvy. And, you know, they look at me like, what are you? Like, wh what is wrong with you? So I don't know how we can bridge that gap, but we need to. Because right now, we're the minority, they're the majority. If we want to make money at this, right, we need to try to sell them on it somehow. 
And right now they're not sold on the utility. And frankly, I don't think the utility is really there, you know? I mean, even uh, you know, when you look at what Pebble is doing, you know, notifications works great, but we're still trying to figure out, like, how do apps work and how do they mesh in with people's lives? And is it really benefiting them? Like, we're constantly second guessing and kind of looking at the data we get back to see, oh, well, this is useful. This, they're using this. This is good. But I think there's, you know, we're kind of like in the very early stages. I think we're actually in those stages where you know how Microsoft tried to do the tablet PC like about 10, 15 years ago? And there was the wrong idea because they were trying to drag a desktop paradigm to a tablet. And then Apple did it right with the iPad. And now we're trying to drag this kind of tablet phone paradigm to a, a mobile, to like to a, a wearable device. And it's not working, right? Like, like you know, putting Android on a, on a watch doesn't, doesn't really work. You need a super lightweight real-time OS. And, and that's, I think that's kind of the crux. We're gonna have to figure out how to create like an OS and an entire user experience that is specifically just about wearables. So, so just to build on that, Miriam, uh, you know, we obviously see, especially with smartwatches now, an increasingly powerful capabilities across you know, lots of new devices. Uh, but we still see, for the most part, the software on them being kind of alert and notification-based value proposition with very little opportunity to actually engage in a complete manner on the device itself. And now what you just said, when you talk about more you know, fully realized operating systems and solutions that can enable those kinds of experiments. I mean, the hardware's already there, if you look at some of the latest stuff that's come down just in the last six months. What, what are folks' thoughts about, about, again, kind of going back a little bit to the tethered model, but the, you know, is, this, is it always like take out your phone? Or is there a way, and, and this phone is the central hub, or is there a model where you can have a more complete experience on the device itself with the apps on the device? I mean, I think, there, I think there's definitely a model where you can have a complete experience on the device. Um, I'm not sure that today that applies to the, the larger consumer public. Um, I do think there are examples, even kind of bridging back to the, to the last question in terms of monetization and also in relation to whether or not it's the device paired with your phone or just the device. Um, there are certain niches where I think the consumer public will actually experience these devices, but it may not be BYOD. They may not have brought their own pair of glass, but they may be experiencing glass or some other type of wearable in another context. So we see this a lot in areas like uh, like sports entertainment, for example, where perhaps their, the monetization has been that their pair of, of their wearable has been provided to them as part of a, a VIP package or something like that. And in those situations, I think it absolutely can be a completely standalone experience that's running off of some sort of Wi-Fi infrastructure that doesn't require uh, the phone to be tethered and has a more uh, streamlined or purpose-built type of application on it, which has more opportunity for interaction. It may be less passive in that case. It may be, oh, I want to get a replay of that play that just happened, or I want to see the stats for this player, or what have you. Yeah, I think there's definitely, I mean, those experiential types of applications. We had done an application that was shown in Smithsonian. We had 23,000 people put on glass for that experience, but it's not quite, you know, the utility for the person. They're putting it on as part of the accessory for the experience. I thought when uh, Samsung announced the, the original uh, Galaxy Gear, it was a conjunction with the Note. And part of the opportunity, I think, that's been created in the smartwatch space is that the phones are so large that it does take some wrenching to get it out of the pocket. It doesn't have that immediacy that the immediacy of the watch is much easier to recognize than when our phones are small. And as the phablet form factors become more popular, the kinds of second screen experiences on the Pebble, on the Gear, on the Talk, on the Android Wear devices become more compelling because that's a big computer that you've got tucked away in your pocket or, or pocketbook. And that kind of creates an opportunity, I think, for the smartwatches when you see that excitement around them, that these are devices that, hey, that makes it easier, I can keep that away, I don't have to constantly take out my phone to see who texted me, who called me, and it's a lower barrier to entry than making yourself look like a cyborg. Yeah, I think um, there's a certainly a, a valid in-between stage where the phone is the hub, like the internet connection, and... Uh, that where the watch is a, or the wearable is a companion device. We're seeing that with the sports bands. We're even seeing that with glass somewhat since it really, unless it has a Wi-Fi connection, needs to tether to a phone. Uh, we're seeing that with watches. I think um, what, would like, what I'd like to see us do is perhaps wear a tiny little hot Bluetooth hotspot uh, in our back pocket or on our belt that will have a 4G LTE connection 
and we'll provide a very solid Bluetooth um, PAN uh, mesh network for all our devices, including our phone at that point. Uh, whatever that phone is, really just a mini tablet, I guess, or lar they're getting large now, yes. so a large tablet in some way. But I think, I think, uh, you know, I think we'll get to that point. But I, you know, the vision that the carriers have and the operators, where every device has a SIM and is on the network, I think we're still very far from that. Primarily because they're screwing with us, right? Primarily because they're trying to make it too expensive and they're greedy bastards. Right. If so, you're going to make me have a different data plan for my 15 different devices and each one has to have its own data plan, they can kiss it off. I don't right. care. Right. So no, I think until it. until they become reasonable and let us do this, then perhaps we can all mesh on their network. I'm, I'm not saying it's a bad idea. But right now, you know, we're talking about technical challenges. I think we're very smug here. Uh, we're, we're, there are tons of technical challenges. The reason, you know, we can we can only do one week battery life on Pebble because we have a black and white display. It's not that we can't get a color display. The problem is as soon as we get one, the battery is crazy and it's not readable in daylight. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of issues that we still I mean, that's have to the glass overcome. problem, right? I mean, I have a Google Glass as well. And what, it lasts a couple hours if you're lucky? I mean, yeah. if you're using it in general context all the time, it's going to die like that. So you're constantly having to it's recharge the thing. And guys, guys yeah. I, I want to interrupt just before we run out of time because there's so much more we could still talk about, but we, we have to keep our time here pretty short. And so I just want to ask one question and building on this last point, which is we all want to see a ton of innovation in the app space, the top of the stack, the user experience for wearables, right, that really helps take this market to the next level. Will we see that in the next 12 months? And I'd like on this one just to go down the line, maybe Q, you could kick us off. Uh, will we see that in the next 12 months? And, 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 and if not, what do you think are the things that, that stand in the way that need to, you know, that need to change to kind of you know, open up that next level of adoption and user value? And I'd love it if you guys could all comment you know, from a business perspective as well as kind of a user, pers user engagement perspective. I mean, I think that, not to say that Apple has all the answers because they clearly don't, but they went a little step in the right direction yesterday with their health application. It has a terrible user interface, so it needs a ton of work. It's ugly. It's one of the ugliest things I've ever seen them do. But conceptually, it's very sound, which is, here, let's tap into this, similar to what they did with their home system, right? Which is, we're not going to provide the hardware, we'll just provide a hub for you guys to connect to. And I think that, especially in a conference like this, with a bunch of startups for wearables, I think there is a need to get out of the siloed mentality of proprietary software and work a little bit more towards an open platform and, and not, not try to hold the key so much. You know, make, fo focus on the hardware you're making, but you know, share the data with each other because that's how you're gonna get more and more people to use the, the hardware in the first place. If they have to have a different app for every single piece of um, hardware they're wearing, that's just cumbersome, it's too much. I don't wanna scroll through five or six different apps to check my glucose and my heart rate and my steps for the day. If I can open up one application and that's all there, that's beneficial. And if startups don't do it, again, somebody like Android or somebody like Apple will do it, and they're going to steal a lot of the thunder, and then they'll start making their own hardware as well, and they'll have their own ecosystem. So now's the time in infancy to band together, especially with all these people here, start talking to each other and working towards that and giving people that access. It'll make it a little bit easier and help the applications be better. Yeah, I agree. I think um, you know this is exactly what we are trying to do at Pebble, is we want to be an open platform, we want to collaborate with others, because we know we can't do it ourselves, and we do believe that it's you know, the Internet of Things, which is really what this is about, wearables are part of the Internet of Things, is only going to happen when we all collaborate. You know, at Maker Faire, we, we worked with Spark.io to, you know, hack a bunch of things out there, like toys and whatever, that would be remote controllable through Pebble. The only way that was possible is because we both have open SDKs and, you know, open set of APIs, and we're using standards. This is really important. And, you know, my concern with the you know the Googles and the Apples and Microsofts of the world is that we're going to be losing that if we don't seize that opportunity as a bunch of smaller companies. The other thing is that user experience is key, and software is a huge part of that. Like the hardware itself is not a big deal. You know, you ultimately you have to make it simple enough so that it's cost effective and it gets the job done. But we got to try to teach people that the mentality of spec for the sake of spec and hardware for the sake of hardware is not where it's at. It's about the user experience, the validity and the usefulness of the product, and ultimately, it's, it, you know, rest, a lot of that rests on software and services and the cloud, okay? Like, you know, we look at the effort we put into, into our platform at Pebble, it's mostly about the software. Yeah, I, I think 
Enterprise is here now. And certainly, it's our friends at Brick Simples doing Enterprise apps, at PX Labs doing Enterprise apps. Enterprise is ready for this. This addresses the challenges of the undesk worker, the folks who need access to information, but they also need access to their hands. That's happening now because it doesn't have these same kinds of social barriers associated with wearing a computer on your face. And, and that's continued to be a challenge with devices like Glass. I, Miriam brought up some good points because I look at this as a place we've been before. And when Google announced Glass and the liberation they put into it, I feared that this was going to be a Newton-like moment. Like this little sneak peek we had in the 90s of what computing would become, and then we had to wait a decade. I don't want to have to wait a decade before we have something like this that works well. And Google's been so deliberate in terms of trying, well, how do we build our apps for presence? How do we get developers engaged? And they were very much forcing the consumer consumer apps. But even they have embraced the enterprise as that opportunity because we don't want Glass to be that Newton. Uh, on the plus side, the Palm Pilot, the simpler device that was black and white and very simple and cheaper, is that those simple devices can be the ones that prevail if they provide those user experiences. And that's going to be very interesting to see what happens with this avalanche of smartwatch devices as Pebble pursues its segment, as clearly Motorola is going for the very, you know, on the high end, that you're going to see some market segmentation. You see it in the smart glasses already as well. We're going to see a lot of change. Next 12 months will be exciting. Is it going to be a glorious money-making enterprise? That remains to be seen. But a lot of this, if you look at the history of the devices in the past, we've been these places before. Apple's leadership roles, the simple technology, and the failure of the Newton are all things that we should look at in history when we look at the opportunities for these technologies. I'll keep it quick. I know we're running short on time. Um, I think I would sum it up by this, specifically about user experience and whether or not we think we'll kind of lick that in, in the next 12 months. Um, I think certainly, Dan, I think you're completely right. I think you know wearables are here for the enterprise now. Um, just for all the reasons that you said, they bypass all the social stigmas, they bypass all of the, the situations that might be barriers to adoption in the consumer market. But as far as perfecting the user experience, I think within the next 12 months, um, certainly efforts that are out there today and ones that we'll see in the future will make the user experience the best as it, that it possibly can be on the devices that we have today. I would also caveat that by saying, look at where the devices are today versus where they were one year ago or two years ago and extrapolate what the devices will be capable of 24 months from now or three years from now. And I think they're going to, as those devices mature and become even better, they're going to provide more capability that allow the user experience to become even more encompassing and more, uh, more exciting. Guys, thank you all for so successfully teasing out the key issues that no doubt are going to drive the future of wearable apps. Uh, and uh, please join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>